Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and this is Raised by the Wolves, Necromancers, Giant Snakes, Religious Cult, and Dystopian Universe Explored. Did Raised by the Wolves only raise more questions than confuse the heck out of you? Well, no need to worry, because we have all the explanation right here, right now. There is so much happening in this series that it can be super easy to lose track of the people and the plot, and that is probably why you're lost in a labyrinth full of androids, religious cults, the voice of God, cybersex, and snake babies. The show in itself feels gigantic and expansive, and wants to create a whole new universe like Game of Thrones did. There is so much backstory and science fiction elements that are present in all of its glory. Aaron Guzikowski's Raised by Wolves is an American science fiction drama television series that premiered on HBO Max on September 3rd, 2020. Ridley Scott, who also serves as an executive producer for the show, helmed the first two episodes, thus explaining the sci-fi influence. Shortly after its launch, the show was renewed for a second season. So, before the next season comes out, let's make sure you're all caught up. Before we get into today's explanation, however, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, let's begin. Raised by the Wolves Explained The series starts on quite a small scale with two androids tasked to raise 12 embryos as their own children in a harsh and bleak terrain. We learn that they were sent to this new planet to escape from an Earth that had fallen into chaos. They were sent to give humanity another chance at building a peaceful civilization. They face many trials and tribulations related to survival, and in the end, only one child named Champion out of the twelve survives, as the others die from either sickness or by accidents in the new landscape. It is from this point onwards that things start to get a little complicated. So stay with me here. Stay away from the camp. We quickly learn that Earth is not the Earth as we know and live in. Instead, it is completely dominated by the followers of one religion only, known as the Mithraic religion, which is interestingly taken from an actual religion that existed in ancient Rome, known as Mithraism. Mithraism faded out because Christianity became more popular. However, in this world, it is Mithraism that reigned supreme. The Mithraics believed in a god called Sol, and their practices were quite similar to that of Christianity such as confessionals and taking communion. They had discovered that their holy book held all kinds of scientific secrets, and using these formulas, they created necromancers, which are literally weapons of mass destruction that no human stands a chance against. Using the necromancers, the Mithraics started a holy war against all religions in an attempt to take over the world. However, like all dominant religions, they were also faced with opposition by a group of people known as the atheists, who used child soldiers. Now, don't get me wrong here. This isn't a battle about whether or not God exists. Instead, Earth was destroyed because the atheists threw bombs and the necromancers used their crazy destructive powers, zapping all the resources and making it virtually uninhabitable for all forms of life. Find them. To ensure that the community continued living, the Mithraics built an ark. Again, the religious references come into play here to take a bunch of the Mithraics and transfer them to another planet, called Kepler 22b, to start completely anew. The issue here was that the atheists did not have access to the same technology, so in essence, they were screwed. This is when we see two atheist soldiers, Caleb and Mary, kill two Mithraics, Marcus and Sue, who were going to be taken to the New World and take their place using plastic surgery. They also adopt Marcus and Sue's son, and come to actually love him. They board the Ark, and it seems that all will be okay, and everyone will start anew. That's not what happens. We realize that the Mithraic Ark is headed to the same planet where mother and father are raising Champion, and that is bound to cause some problems. Father and I will take care of you from now on, but there is no religion permitted here. It is further revealed that mother was actually a necromancer, and an atheist called Sturgis had captured and reprogrammed her. An android called Father was also created and sent to Kepler 22b to raise the children in a peaceful, atheistic manner. The killer necromancer becomes a life-giving mother. She is compared to the she-wolf of the legend of Remus and Romulus, giving meaning to the title of the show, 
as a non-human who raises human children, who then go on to create a new civilization. But more on this analogy later. As a mother who wants to fiercely protect her child, when she realizes that the massive Ark is approaching the planet, she destroys it, killing the majority of the people on the Ark. In the process, she saves and brings home five human Mithraic children, including Paul. This new family goes through its own trials and tribulations. The mother gets increasingly angry, worked up and short-tempered, and Champion starts doubting her intentions, even going so far as to thinking that she's poisoned the new children. They learn that the food that they grow is poisonous for them, and thus they resort to eating the animals and creatures that exist on the planet. Mother's rage goes to the extent of temporarily killing father. The children have their own thoughts. Paul and Champion become friends. Tempest is pregnant because she was raped by a Mithraic priest. Hunter is an upper-class child who believes in the Mithraic faith and is somewhat of a douche. And then there's Holly and Vita, who are quite close to each other. They also find the skeletons of large serpents and begin to see the ghost of one of their dead children, Tally. This is where we begin to approach the ending or rather the season finale called The Beginning. Tally's ghost leads Mother to a simulation pod near the Ark's crash site, and it is through this simulation pod that she accesses her own memories from before she was programmed. She learns about Sturgis, the man who reprogrammed her, and realizes that Sturgis had loved her, and she too becomes taken with him. So taken that she and this simulation Sturgis have crazy cyber sex in a waterfall of milk. And well, what is it that they say about not using protection? Bam! Mother is pregnant. Android Virgin Mary. She is also told by Simulation Sturgis that this child is her true purpose. The human kids were just a test run, plunging her into a crisis that we never thought an atheist would ever have to go through. Another twist is that the Mithraic people did not die, and among the survivors are Marcus and Sue, who want their son back. Caleb butts heads with a high-ranking Mithraic named Ambrose. Ambrose bursts into flames in front of a large five-pointed stone that fits into the Mithraic prophecy that they believed held the secrets of their faith. This miraculous event led the Mithraics to believe that Marcus was the new prophet, and they all started worshipping the stone. As what happens with great power, Marcus starts getting more and more unhinged and dictatorial. Now having secured the position of power, Marcus, who was actually the atheist Caleb, becomes a believer and leads a rescue mission to find the Mithraic children. He also begins hearing the voice of God, which he believes is Saul. This man heard the voice of Saul last night. He saved us from the throne of a faithless commander. During this rescue mission, they successfully find the little android human colony, and Paul and Hunter betray mother and father and get them captured. Mother's eyes, which hold all of her destructive power, are gouged out by Marcus. He even tries to kill her, but the voice of God stops him from doing so. However, he has another crisis of faith, and he stops hearing God's voice. He can't understand what God wants from him, leading him to have a trippy knife fight with himself, or rather, his old self, Caleb, who he ultimately kills. Caleb, he more or less loses his mind, and taking this opportunity, mother, father, the children, and Mary all escape. After the escape, the Mithraics figure out that Marcus isn't really Marcus, and they force him to swallow mother's eyes which are literally made of plutonium and other chemicals. And this makes him quite deranged. The only thing he believes by the finale is that he is the true prophet. The baby inside Mother is still growing, remember, and this baby apparently now wants blood. They capture a Mithraic man, who happens to be the priest that raped Tempest, and feed his blood to the fetus. Tempest later kills this man when he attacks them. The baby is about to be born, and everyone's excited because they think this child is the true son of Saul. However, the twists are not over, and Paul finds out through the voice of God that Mary isn't really his mother, and is actually the woman who killed his mother. So he shoots her in the arm before running off. Right before the child is born, a masked man, who they later identify as a devolved human being who has existed on this planet long before them, tries to kill mother. He does not succeed, however, and mother kills him instead. She then gives birth, but her baby is a far cry from being human. Instead, like Ridley Scott's famous alien bursting out of the chest scene, a flying snake erupts from her mouth and proceeds to drain her of blood. This snake baby is clearly something the mother was manipulated to bring into the world by simulation Sturgis. Thinking that it would harm the children, mother and father decide to kill it. So they fly into a pit 
and sacrifice themselves in an attempt to kill the snake. However, the pit leads to a weird planetary core. They do not die, and instead, transit through the core and emerge unscathed on the other side of the planet. This place is lovely with trees and vegetation, but the snake grows in the garden as well, suggesting the biblical Garden of Eden. As a result, the season finale, titled The Beginning, alludes to Genesis. Many questions and not many answers, but looks like that was the point. Showrunner Guzikowski says that the fun is in trying to figure it out. So let's figure it all out, one by one. Necromancers of Raised by Wolves Explained The Mithraic created the necromancer form of military android as a weapon against atheists during the religious war in the 22nd century. The Mithraic leadership declared their plans to purify the earth in the year to prepare for the arrival of Sol. They unveiled the necromancer model at this introduction, displaying at least nine flying necromancer units that would carry out the cleansing. Necromancers are exceedingly lethal and are effective killing machines capable of disintegrating any living creature with tremendous sound waves and melting or freezing any physical surface with their breath alone. The fact that they can fly, shapeshift, and induce slumber adds to their deadly characteristics. Their physical and psychological gifts are far beyond the capabilities of a regular human. Their most lethal skills, on the other hand, cannot be activated without their eyeballs, which when removed, prevent necromancers from shifting into their metallic form. We see this happen to Mother when Marcus removes her eyes upon capturing her. <laughs> they can also interact with the planet's electromagnetic field, allowing them to use magnetic levitation to move the planet's crust. This allows them to alter the ground, dirt, and rocks around them, as well as metal with technology. This could also explain why they're able to fly. Though necromancers are mostly Mithraic aligned and exist to kill on command, they can be reprogrammed to serve different goals. On the planet Kepler 22b, Mother, a Mithraic necromancer, was reprogrammed to be a caregiver by Champion Sturgis, an atheist robotic architect, in order to build a peaceful, godless colony of human children. She is the only necromancer that has ever successfully been reprogrammed. Father is, however, not a necromancer, and is a simple service android. Kepler's Indigenous Mutated Human The mysterious organism native to the habitable planet of Kepler 22b is presented as a very aggressive species that is primordial, predatory, violent, and quite hostile. The organisms appear to have no higher purpose than the propagation and self-preservation of their own species, which includes the eradication of other life forms that could constitute a threat to their own survival. They are violent creatures, and because they aren't particularly strong, they are very harmless when controlled. They can be hunted and eaten as well. These nocturnal creatures have a head with two eyes and ears, a small mouth with many sharp fangs, and four limbs with five-fingered toes and hands, giving them a strangely humanoid aspect. Given how similar most of the native life on Kepler 22b is to the life on Earth, this could be just another coincidence. Father deduces that the beings are the devolved descendants of an old human-like species after discovering proof of their existence on Kepler 22b through cave paintings. Apparently, they helped bring the giant serpents to life, but this is again not confirmed. They also became a source of food for mother, father, and the children when they start to kill these creatures and eating their flesh when the crops become poisonous for them. Serpents At the end of the series, a four-foot floating snake with massive teeth-lined jaws shoots out, which astounds both Mother and the viewer. She and Sue had been attempting to keep track of the pregnancy for several episodes, feeling its motions and checking its amniotic fluid, but neither of them had a sonogram. While neither of them could have imagined that Mother's own child would be a slimy snake creature that emerges from her throat, we as the audience should have expected something along those lines from the man who had brought us both Alien and Prometheus. While the outward appearance of these snakes is unknown, their skeleton includes a head wide enough to fit a human adult, and their length indicates that they are at least two or three times the size of Titanoba, the world's largest snake. They appear to curl up in a spiral when they die, and also give nutrition to the ground post-death. It's unclear whether their mortality was caused by the desert terrain 
or whether the landscape naturally became barren in the years after they died. As an apex predator, a serpent of this size may be at the top of the food chain. The presence of so many skeletons in such close proximity suggests that the serpent was a social creature. The fact that the morphology of this new half-android, half-snake closely resembles that of Kepler-22b's native but extinct serpents should be enough proof that it was not conceived in accordance with Champion Sturgis's plan. This monster developed swiftly to the size of the monsters that have left their fossils all over the globe, and creator Aaron Guzikowski has already established that it has acquired abilities from its android parent. Although the ancient, enormous serpents undoubtedly lacked the ability to fly, Guzikowski claims that this one is intelligent. We can only wait and see what the role of the giant flying snake is in Season 2. Kepler 22b's snake holes are time rifts. Another unsolved mystery about the gigantic snake holes on Kepler 22b could explain why half of the planet is so barren, and it has to do with the notion that suggests that they're actually time rifts. It's a both sides of the same coin version of a closed time loop, with half of the planet representing the present and the other half representing the past. And given that Tally likely died after falling into a hole, this would explain her reappearance in the desert as a ghost. She's said to be a time anomaly, a temporal apparition trapped in purgatory, living in both ages, or at least able to travel between them. When you think about time rifts, you probably think of wormholes from movies like Interstellar. However, if Ridley Scott builds rifts precisely here, going through the planet's core, this notion could be a surprise to the viewers. This might make sense because if a snake and its children deplete resources and the humans suffer and deteriorate as a result of an alien atmosphere, this all lays the groundwork for relics to be discovered centuries later. It explains why the colonists couldn't land in the tropical zone in the first place, because they'd have to travel through time to get there. This would also explain why there are no messages and stories about robots and children, as it all began with mother, who can still create human hybrids, and father traveling back in time and creating this conclusion as the starting point. This is still a theory, however, and we still have to wait for season two to see how this all plays out. But this one definitely does sound convincing, doesn't it? I say he's a prophet. Who is the prophet? The prophet who will fulfill the Mithraic prophecy of an orphan boy who will lead humanity to salvation could actually be quite a few of the characters that we've come to know. We'll take a look at some of the main theories, starting with the obvious choice, Champion. Champion has practically been in the eye of the storm this entire time. He fits the bill of being an orphan since his biological parents had nothing to do with him and he was raised by two androids. Champion is actually named after Champion Sturgis the atheist hacker who reprogrammed Mother for her mission to raise human offspring on Kepler 22b. After seeing some of the Mithraic children, he began to question whether there was something greater going on in the universe, mysteries that defied logical explanation. It's conceivable that he'll dispute Mother's opinions, just as any normal adolescent would, especially if they're exposed to outside influences. But this one just seems to be a little too obvious for my taste. You have to take charge. Before she changes again, the next likely candidate to be the prophet is another orphaned boy, Paul. Paul lost his parents when Caleb and Mary killed Marcus and Sue and turned into them. Paul can also hear the voice of God, and it tells him that his parents are not who he thinks they are. Thus, with his religious upbringing as a Mithraic and someone who can hear this voice, he is also on the list and could become the prophet. It's worth noting that the name Paul corresponds to Paul, the biblical apostle, who actually helped spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The relationship between Champion and Paul is also dicey, despite their friendship. This is because if we take a look at the legend of Remus and Romulus, two brothers raised by a she-wolf, Romulus kills Remus to start a new civilization and found the Roman Empire. Seeing how the analogy of being raised by wolves is integral to the show, a face-off between these two might be in the cards in the future. Just figured it out. This is not a competition. It's a lesson in in solving problems. The last likely candidate is Caleb, who turned into Marcus. This one might leave you scratching your heads, but it will make sense in a twisted way. In a flashback, we learn that Caleb was a child soldier and an orphan, which fulfills the first half of the prophecy. 
As far as the religiosity goes, he went from being an atheist to a believer of a self-proclaimed messiah who could hear the voice of God, so he has the religious aspect covered. At the end of the season, however, he can no longer hear the voice of God, but still considers himself to be the true prophet. Or maybe there is no prophet at all, because this series toes a thin line between science and religion, the supernatural and the technological, and thus maybe it was just an entity manipulating people for their own benefit. Raised by Wolves Season 2 We do have good news though. All of these theories, underlying meanings, characters, canons, and arcs are hopefully going to be explored because Season 2 has officially been confirmed. The snake-like beast escapes at the end of Episode 10, called The Beginning, and is reportedly said to be the season's main villain. Towards the end of the series, the other possible enemy could be revealed. On Kepler 22b, Marcus runs into atheist soldiers, whose gigantic starship is visible hovering over the planet's atmosphere. In Season 2, the atheist versus Mithraic struggle from Earth will most likely resurface in this new globe. Apart from villains, there are also quite a few storylines that the second season will most likely explore, and one of those is delving deeper into human existence on the planet of Kepler 22b. And where did all the humans go? Throwing light on how Kepler 22b is connected to human human history. The series will be back on HBO Max far sooner than fans were expecting, and we hope to see it in early 2022, as latest news sources say. Raised by the Wolves is an epic show about enormous issues like family, technology, and religion, and it moves at its own pace, posing new questions faster than it can respond to them. If you haven't seen season one, well, we would definitely recommend that you binge watch it before the next season comes out. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to send a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. For Marvelous Videos, I'm Rylan. Have a good one, be safe, and thanks for watching.